make sure you click the link to subscribe to my YouTube channel and also click the notifications button to be notified for when my next podcast goes live. You can also follow me on my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest is. You can follow me on Facebook at James English 11, Twitter at James English 0, Instagram James English 2. You can also download these podcasts on Podbean, iTunes, and Spotify. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Thank you. And we're on. And today's guest, we've got a legend who is David Ike. First of all, David, I just want to say thanks for coming on the show and no give, problem, giving man. me your time, man. I appreciate that. No problem. You're a very busy man. Well, thank goodness, really, because um, when I started out on this journey 30 years ago, um, you know, there weren't a lot of people who were interested in talking about these subjects. Um, and it was a very lonely road then. But now, as you say, um, it's finding time to... Um, to, to talk to all the people that want to that want to discuss this stuff. So so we have made progress. Much as the world needs to make a lot more, we have made uh, progress in terms of uh, people are now um, now more open to looking at things that they would have waved away by reflex action before. So it's all it's all good. Yeah, good. And we'll touch on that. Thirty years ago, you made a decision to speak openly about the things that you believed in, which takes massive courage, so massive respect for that. And I think people don't understand that to believe in something that no one else understands or to research things that people don't understand, you are called crazy and you've said it yourself, you are ridiculed. Um, we'll go right back to the start of your life, how it started, where you were brought up and how you get involved in the stuff you're involved in now. Gold. How long have you got? <laughs> um, the, um, I was born on a council estate um, in Leicester, where my brother still lives in the same house, um, in 1952, and uh, we were skinned. Um, but, you know, it's a funny thing. We were skinned, and uh, things were incredibly tight, but I never felt deprived. You know, you, you, you made your own uh, fun and, and stuff. You didn't need a, a thing to do it. Uh, you didn't need computers or smartphones, and you 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 had to use your imagination, and and you had to um, do things without any money. And but I enjoyed my childhood. I was watching steam trains and playing football, and and I, and I enjoyed it. And I didn't perceive myself as deprived, even though you know we were literally um, living from week to week. Um, I, I one of my earliest memories is going around the back of the clock factory where my father worked um, on a Thursday lunchtime when he got paid and he would nip out the back didn't want to let anyone else see him to give me mother the pay packet he just had so we could eat that night it was that, that tight and um, you know I remember as a kid you would um, I, I didn't even realize for a long time why it was but the door would knock and then my mother would say quick shh, shh, shh. And she, she'd take us around the back of the sofa and we'd, I'd be on the sofa and I'm, I'm a little boy, what's going on? And what was happening is the rent man would knock on the door and if there's no answer, he'd go to the front window and look, in, look inside so we were right on the sofa. <laughs> so, but, but, but all, you know, I, I, it, it wasn't that you felt deprived. Uh, and I, um, I love my childhood and, you know, uh, I, I, I wouldn't change it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's always... Um, kind of that attitude to life has always stayed with me. Uh, you know, I, I'm not someone who, um, you know, looks down on people you know, because they don't have money or they don't have this or don't have that because I, I've been there. And um, for me, we're all individual expressions of the same consciousness, just having different experiences. And we should start supporting each other and seeing uh, as all as as one consciousness having different experiences instead of self-identifying with all these buddy labels you know for me the, the, the world is controlled and humanity is controlled and controls itself and creates the very ground uh, for which divide and rule is possible which allows the few to control the many through its obsession with labels. So we say, 
you're working. Do you remember that that great um, scene on the on the uh, on the old uh, 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 old David Frost program, where you had the three guys? John Cleese was one, and the, the and and Ronnie Ronnie Barker and Ronnie Corbett were the were the others, and they were different sizes. And and uh, John Cleese was a was was um, dressed as a rich man in in the, the nice suit, and then you had. Ronnie Barker, next one down. He was kind of middle class in a trilby, and then you had um, uh, Ronnie Corbett, little little guy on the end, and he was kind of working class with the flat cap, you know, all the cliches. And and it was a wonderful thing be, uh, uh, describing the way that labels um, dictate our interaction. Where one saying, "I look down on him because I am upper class," and then the guy in the middle was saying, "And I look down on him because he is lower class." And we both look up on him because he's upper class. And these labels, um, labels of race, labels of um, sexuality, labels of religion. Um, and and w- these are not who we are. They are experiences that our consciousness is having, our awareness is having. And... Once you start self-identifying with the label, you start um, looking at yourself in terms of little me. I am my label. I am Ethel who works on the checkout at Tesco. That's all I am. No, you are an expression of infinite awareness having an experience called Ethel on the checkout. You know, Bill driving the bus. You know, you say to people, uh, who are you? They, you say, well, I, I'm Bill. I come from Manchester and I drive a bus. No, no, that's what you're experiencing. Bill is the name of your current experience. What you are is consciousness having that experience. And this might seem like esoteric navel gazing, but it's not. It's a totally different way of interacting with the world. And it's a totally different uh, way of self-identifying yourself. Because when you, when you say, I am R, and the labels then follow, you are self-identifying with limitation. You're self-identifying, I am my experience. And if I'm, you know, uh, born in Leicester in a working class um, uh, council house, then th- that, that defines me. That's, that's who I am. No, no, that's just where you were born. Mm. You have the potential to be whatever you want to, want to be and whatever you, you, you choose to be. But what we've, what we've got now is a, a massive extension even of that whereby your label is everything. Not only do, are people defining themselves by the labels, the world is increasingly defining them more than ever before by them. And this is where what we, what we call today identity politics comes from, where it's not about what is right or, or, or fair or just, which is surely the way to look at anything. It's how does this affect my label? So if I'm uh, transgender and something happens, how does this affect my label? If I'm this race or that race or that religion or that religion and something happens, well, how does this affect my label? So people are constantly judging the world by how it affects their label instead of saying, well, hold on a minute, never mind all that. Is it right? Is it fair? Is it just? No matter what label he's talk, we're talking about, is it fair? Is it just? Is it, um, is it right? And so what you have is a situation where um, we have developed this, uh, this belief among increasing numbers of people, particularly young people through the universities and colleges, whereby you judge everyone by a group and then you tag the group, whether it's good or not good. So therefore, instead of seeing a world of individuals with individual thoughts, opinions, observations, you judge everyone by a group. So if you say something about one group, you're a bigot, you're a Nazi, um, a, 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 and uh, a, a racist or, or a fascist. And if you say something about another group, then, and that group is labeled um, bad, then you say what you bloody like. Yeah, but that, we spoke about that earlier, David. If people are divided from religion, from race, 
they're easy to control. The masses are easy to control because everybody's fighting and arguing whose beliefs yeah. are right. And for me personally, we're all equal. We all deserve a chance. And to set limits on yourself, you're crazy because everything is limitless. You're the one who can control and take whatever you want to do out of life. For you, when you started your journey, David, obviously you went through the Terry Wogan show, which was massive for you because you came on that show and you spoke out how you believed in and the things that you seen and the things you were educating yourself with because you always say they ridiculed you which I believe was it's sad when you watched that interview um, when you were going on that did you know that that was going to be the outcome yeah it's kind of funny um, people, people, people said to me didn't you know that would happen if you said this and said that and I thought I said well do you know I'd work that out mm -hmm. but you say it anyway I, I, but, but you see there's a lot of background um, with that because I was um I was going through my life. I, I, I left um, uh, school at 15. I didn't take a major exam because I went to be a professional footballer with Coventry and, and, and others. And then um, my career ended with rheumatoid arthritis. I played a, a whole year of league football with rheumatoid arthritis. That's a whole story in, in itself. Uh, but what that did is it developed, it de developed in you because all these things are within us. And experience brings them out. And if you don't have experience, often they don't come out. So um, I have this phrase, um, life tends to give us our greatest gifts brilliantly disguised as our worst nightmares. Mm -hmm. Because often our worst nightmare will, will, will bring things out of us that wouldn't otherwise happen. This is why if you, if you bring your kids up and you protect them from everything, you're doing them no favors because you're not developing strong people who will be able to deal with life. You're developing people uh, who um, are always looking to be um, protected. And, and, and look, look at what we have now. And, and once you have a generation or, or you have a population that wants to be protected and perceives itself all the time as being a victim, where does the power, uh, point of power move? It moves to authority because people look to authority to protect them from what they fear or what they feel victimized by. So what we have, we've been developing is a population uh, 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 of, of emotionally weak people who perceive themselves in terms of victims. When you have challenges in life and you meet them, um, it brings something out of you. So for instance, when um, my... Uh, my arthritis came and I didn't know what, what else am I going to do at that time? I wanted to be a footballer. I wanted to be a footballer since I was a kid. And now my joints are swelling up and, and, and they're telling me I'm going to have to pack it in. And I thought, I'm not packing it in. I, I, I want to give it a go. So I, I, I went to a club called Hereford United that was a league club then. And um, I, I played the whole season with rheumatoid arthritis. Every morning when we were training uh, and warming up for training, on cold English mornings, I was in agony. And, and, and I would be limping and what have you, and the players would say, oh, what's wrong now, Ike? And I, 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 I would give a different excuse, oh, I've got a bit of a pull, oh, I think I've got a bit of a blister. But actually it was the same thing all the time. Uh, and, and I played the season out, and eventually it got so bad that I couldn't carry on, but it brought something out of me, this, this determination not, not to give up and not to give in. And then I, um, I, I decided, because when I was a kid, I, I was always reading newspapers and I uh, was very interested in journalism. So I, I became a journalist and long story short, I eventually became uh, a television presenter. Were well, very well known back then? Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was, I was a national television presenter in those days. Um, which we, uh, and when I look at my life now, you see, and, and what I'm doing, my life before, which appeared to be a series of random events... Same with you. You've had your challenges yeah. in life. What has it done? It's made you the person you are. You wouldn't be the person you are now without them. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, I regret that. I regret that. Well, the, 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 the thing to regret is if you don't learn from the experience. That's the regret. But learning from the experience, well, you've had a gift. What are you regretting for? And um, so um, I, um, I went to, uh, into journalism because I, I, I was very interested in that. And I eventually became this television presenter. And when you look at my life, as I was saying, um, all the different elements of it, including going into journalism and seeing the media for what it is, going into politics with the Green Party and seeing politics for what it is, well, I, I didn't know at the time, but they were all giving me very, very um, important uh, understandings that would be useful later on. And then what happened is, yes, I mean, this is a kind of bizarre story, but 
it happened. I uh, was uh, I was in the Green Party, uh, and and I and I was still working for the BBC as a television presenter, and both were leaving me completely cold. Um, you know, the, uh, the, 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 B, the BBC, um, it, it, it's, it's not a great organization to work for if you care about the, the, the truth and you care about, um, you know, more than the official version of everything. And uh, I also was looking at the, at the Green Party politics from the inside and seeing that it was just like every other party. And so I was, uh, what do I do with my life now? Because I, I, I can't go on with either of these. And what happened was a very strange thing happened because in the um, early um, part of what would it be, um, 1989, I started having this feeling that when I was in a room alone, I wasn't alone. And it's like this, it's like this, there was an atmosphere there. There's, there's something there. And through 1989, this, this got more and more and more powerful to the point where in early 1990, I was working for the BBC and I was, I was staying at a hotel called Kensington Hilton, just down from the BBC uh, uh, headquarters. And I'm sitting on the side of the bed and in, in this apparently empty room and, and there, there was such a sense of a presence there that I said into the room, you know, if there's something there, would you please contact me because you'll drive me up the wall. Few... Um, Days later, um, I'm on the seafront with my son, Gareth, little boy then, in Ride, uh, where I live on the Isle of Wight. And um, I, 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 I go into this newsagent shop where uh, Gaz was looking at one of the books. And I said to him, come on, Gaz, we'll go and get some lunch in the town. And, and as I said it, it was like the atmosphere changed, like the energetic field around me changed. And all I heard, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a voice, it was a very strong thought form. It said, go and look at the books on the far side. And I'm standing there thinking, you know. Do not shut yourself. Yeah. <laughs> what, no, basically, what the? <laughs> so I start walking across to the books in, in, a, in a daze, thinking, what is happening? And I knew this bookshop. The books it sold were for, you know, the tourists that come to the Isle of Wight. They were basically Mills and Boone and, and, and you know, perfectly formed English roses and having relationships with perfectly formed, you know, uniformed soldiers and all this stuff. So I'm thinking, what am I going over here for? But right in the middle of these books was one called Mind to Mind by a woman called Betty Shine. A, a, a picture was on the front. It was different to the other. So I picked it up and I turned it over and I read the blurb. And she was a psychic. Uh, an English psychic, and uh, she uh, was telling her life story. So I bought the book, read it in 24 hours, found it very interesting, contacted her, um, because I wanted to go and see if she would pick up what the hell was happening around me for the last year. And um, so I went, I told her nothing. What I told her was, because she did this hands-on healing as well, which is just an exchange of energy. You know, it's not mumbo-jumbo, it's an exchange of energy. Ricky. Yes, it's just an exchange of energy. That's all it is. But anyway, um, I told her that because I said, I've got arthritis. Maybe it will help because I didn't want to give anything away what was happening to me. So I'm sitting on this bench, um, this medical type bench in her front room, and, you know, she's chatting away and she's doing the whole, you know, hands on healing just next to my left knee. And suddenly the atmosphere changed again. And um, I felt like a spider's web on my face. Now, what hit me was in her book, she said, when other levels of reality are trying to lock into you, you sometimes feel like a spider's web on your face. Well, I know what that, what, that, that was now. It's electromagnetic energy. You know, you know when you, 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 you're in a, a, a crowd, a football crowd with, of, of great emotional excitement, you, you feel like a charge of energy. Mm -hmm. The hair stands yeah, up yeah, on your yeah. neck, you know. That's electromagnetic. They're electromagnetic fields. So that's what I was feeling. But it did feel like a spider's web on my face. And I said nothing to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to Betty, but I'm thinking, what the hell? And then about 10 or 15 seconds later, um, she reels her head back and she said, my God, this is powerful. I've got to close my eyes for this one. And my bums for going further down the... <laughs> what have you got yourself into here, Ike? <laughs> and she starts telling me in March 1990... 
that I'm going to go out on a world stage and reveal great secrets. I would face enormous opposition, but they, whatever that is, would always be there to protect me. And that the, there was a, a shadow over the world that, and there was a story that needed to be told that humanity was, gonna, was going to go through a phase of waking up and coming out of basically its coma, um, which is programming, and that I was going to go out and do that. Uh, one man cannot change the world, but one man can communicate the message that can change the world was one of the things she said. And I'm sitting there. I'm a television presenter for the BBC. I'm a national spokesman for the Green Party. Uh, and I'm thinking, what are you talking about? <laughs> and, and so... I then leave, 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 leave her and get on a train. Uh, she lived near Hassocks in Sussex, and, 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 um, or in Hassocks, actually. And, and then I, I drove up or, or, or went up in the train to present a television program. But from that moment on, what, one of the things that was said, that, that she said, because she said, the first thing she said, she had no idea about this interaction in the Kensington Hilton. She's saying that they're telling me they know you, you wanted them to contact you, but the time wasn't right. And you, you, you know, now you've been brought here to be contacted. And they said, uh, they're saying that you're going to be led to knowledge. And at other times, knowledge will be put into your mind. Oh, all right. Okay. What? Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, after that. See, at that time, David, did you think she was maybe crazy because you didn't no. understand that? Or would you an open book? Because when you speak out about stuff like that, people go, well, he's maybe crazy. But yeah. again, it's judging people and everybody's in their own different paths. Yeah. I mean, wh what I've been like, uh, mate, all my life is um, I've never dismissed things that um, I can't know absolutely are not true. Um, I, 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 I have this policy, I put things on the back burner and I see what comes. And if more information comes to support it, more information comes to support it, there comes a point where there's so much information supporting that that it crosses the line and you, know, you start to say, okay, I accept this is what's happening. But I don't just dismiss things mm -hmm. and never have on the basis that they're different, just being the way I've always been. Was that the start of your journey then, going to this woman and everything, like it, awakening, a spiritual yes, awakening? Yeah, yes, yeah, it was. And, and um, you know, one of the, um, one of the, the things was that, you know, it, it was going to be tough. Uh, and, and so when I left that, um, left her house and got on with life, very, very quickly, synchronicity coincidences started to occur where i'd i'd meet people come across information come across books come across documents whatever that were starting to like hand me puzzle pieces and i started to realize as it built up and it built up and it built up that actually the world was not like i thought it was well not like i thought it was i didn't really have that, a, a, a view on that i think you just brainwashed it and didn't yeah, really understand I, 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 I never did believe that politicians around the world i always felt there was something else but you didn't even you didn't know what it was now i was beginning to understand what question it was everything. And how it works yeah and another thing that happened is that i would get uh just a knowing that this is how i think this is what's going on here and then what would follow would be names dates places hard factual information that would support that view um which kind of connects with we will put knowledge into his mind and this has gone on now for 30 years and it's gone through different different phases of information and uh it's taken me down a an extraordinary uh road of uncovering the world as it is behind the facade of what we're told it is and of course it's taken me into realms of enormous ridicule and enormous abuse but we come back to the greatest gift uh, often that you are ever given is your worst nightmare or what appears to be so if we go back to the wogan show because what happened eventually is i went on the wogan show and talked about what was happening to me and at that time i was right in that period of the wogan show it was a period of about three months I was going through an enormous transformation of that you didn't perception understand. that I didn't understand. No, because this is what happened, just very, very, very briefly, um, is that I, 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 
suddenly got this feeling I, I needed to go to Peru. I didn't know why. I'd never been there. I, I watched them play in the World Cup uh, a few times, but I didn't know anything about it. And long story short, I ended up in Peru and a, no, a, a series of enormously uh, 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 amazing things happened to me. And it culminated at a place called Siustani, which is near a place called Puno, near Lake Titicaca, highest navigable lake in the world, they say, about 13,000 feet. And, and I ended up, and a series of synchronicities again, at this so-called Inca site um, called Siustani, which is all Inca ruins on a hill, and there's a, a lake and mountains right out in the middle of nowhere. And... I went and I, I looked around it and then I'd, I'd hired this taxi and this uh, guide who came with me and, and we're driving away from Siustani um, and I'm just um, daydreaming, which I do all the time, daydreaming out the window, sort of mind wandering. And I'm looking at this hill as we're coming towards it. And as I looked at this hill, all I could hear in my head was come to me, come to me, come to me. You know, and I'm thinking, you know, I, I, was, introducing, I was introducing the snooker uh, not long ago, actually. And now this freaking hill's talking to me. You know? <laughs> it's like, you know, it's what's going on? <laughs> Steve Davis, Jimmy White, all is forgiven. <laughs> and so I, t I got asked the guy to stop. I said, I won't be a minute. I'm going up that hill. And I walked up the hill. And I didn't know where I was going or why. And... Um, there's there's this, all these kind of stones. It's kind of a kind of circle like of stones, and I, I walked into the middle, and it's beautiful. And there's not a cloud in the sky. It's a, a pure blue Peruvian sky, piercing sun, red nose to prove it. And I stood there, and what happened to me then happened to me. I cover this bit in the news shop in Ride, where I'm standing there, and suddenly I feel like my feet are being pulled to the ground and like, like magnetically. And I'm feeling like a drill in the top of my head. And the atmosphere changed again. Only this was much more powerful than the news shop. And I heard this, again, very strong thought form go through my mind, which said, um, first of all, they'll be talking about this 100 years from now. What? And then which seemed absolutely crazy given the sky and the sun and the, it will be over when you feel the rain, right? And then what happened is um, my arms went out like that without me making any decision to, 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 to do that. And then this energy got more and more powerful. And in the end, my body's shaking. And, and what... Um, was happening it's like when you're driving a car and you can't remember the last mile your subconscious has been driving the car thank goodness um, I, I kept coming back to some kind of consciousness and then going it, it, back somewhere else and as I came back to consciousness at one point my conscious mind I noticed that over the far distant mountains there was a light gray mist and I'm watching it and it's getting darker and it's getting darker faster and I think it's freaking raining. And then over, not very long, the whole thing took maybe, I don't know, an hour, 45 minutes an hour. This storm came out of the, I mean, you couldn't make it up. If you, if you, put, if you put this on a, on, on a movie, they'd say, oh, come on. It happened. This, this storm is coming towards me. And you know whether people talk about a, a front. Yeah. Well, this is a front. It's a straight bloody line. I'm looking up. It's, it's, it's literally out of some crazy movie. And this, and it's stair rod rain. It's not just raining, it's stair rod rain. And it's coming towards me. And I'm standing there and, and I'm seeing this wall of water coming towards me. It's like something out of bloody Moses. <laughs> <laughs> Freaking <laughs> Red Sea. And, 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 he, he, and, and by this time, I'm, my body's shaking like crazy with this energy coming through me. And then the water hit me. I mean, I'm immediately drenched because it's stair rod rain. And bang, the energy stopped. And I staggered forward like Bambi because my legs were gone. And uh, there, were en there was energy pouring out my feet and pouring out my hands. And it's still pouring out of uh, my feet. I couldn't sleep that night uh, because of it. Um, and something changed. Um, 
I, 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 you, you, if you, people could imagine you lived your life in a bubble, um, literally a bubble of information, a bubble of perception, and someone's come along without any warning and popped the bloody thing. <laughs> and suddenly everything that was outside the bubble was pouring in. So my mind is absolutely awash with information, concepts, insights, what the hell's going on? That you know, it was just a, a chaotic mass of, of of information and thought and everything. And in that period, it lasted about three months. If you'd have asked me my name, I'd have checked. And that it was in that period, in my turquoise shell suit, that I went on to um, the um, the Wogan show, and and everything that 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 happened, um, and. After about three months, after all the ridicule and all the newspapers and all that stuff, basically, you, you know when you, you, you press too many keys on a computer and the computer freezes, mm -hmm. says, I can't process this. Well, that was me. There was so much information pouring into my uh, uh, conscious mind as a result of that experience in Peru. I, I couldn't process it. I mean, I, you basically froze. What happened after three months is it unfroze and now i'm i'm the old david again but i ain't just more i'm seeing the world in a completely different way i'm see i'm uh, as they as they say when you read a newspaper uh, the the truth is in the white bits not the words the bits in between you know you, you, and and so I, I was seeing things and connections that i um couldn't see before. Did you ever question yourself there, David, and think, am I losing my mind? Do I need to go and get help? Or did you just feel right for you? Did, it, well, did you understand that a bit more? Well, it felt right to me. I'm say I completely understood it then. Um, it felt right to me. And, and I, 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 did, I did what I always do, like I've just mentioned earlier. I thought, okay, I'm going with this, and we're going to see where it's going to go. Um, and I didn't know where it was going, but I'm going to go with this and see where it goes. Um, and people were coming up to me after that, you know, shh, unfreezing. And they were saying, I thought, they thought you'd gone mad. You're the same Dave I used to know. But I wasn't. I, I appeared to be, but I wasn't. I was seeing the world in a completely different way. And, of course, in, in a world which is overwhelmingly programmed to see the world in a certain way, it's what happens through the education system and the media and peer pressure. It's very, very narrow band of sense of the possible, sense of what is. When you start talking about things that are different to that, then immediately the reaction is you're crazy or you're dangerous, or in my case, um, you're both. But <laughs> what followed, what followed, of course, was mass ridicule as a result the Wogan show. And people said, you know, it must have been horrible. Well, it was, but it was the greatest gift I ever have been given because it set me free of the prison that most people live in, which is the fear of what other people think. Mm -hmm. When you literally can't walk down the street without being laughed at, I mean, I lived my life for a long time after that to the sound of distant or even close laughter. Um, going into a pub, forget it. Um, and uh, so you either go under and you disappear. But the majority of people do. Yeah, or you come out like steel honed in the fire and you let go of this, this, this prison, this ball and chain that most of the population of the world live in, the fear of what other people think. Most people, the vast majority of people, because of this fear, are not living their truth. They're not living their life. They're not living their uniqueness they're living what they think is acceptable to other people's version of what they should be. So they, they go through mental gymnastics before saying things, e even more today with political correctness and all this bollocks. Um, what can I say? So they, d they won't say I'm this or that, or, or what can I say and how can I say it so they won't think I'm mad. Now, when the world appears, it wasn't the world, there were others that saw through it, but certainly appeared to be the world and was the vast majority are ridiculing you mercilessly 
I mean, someone only had to say my name uh, in, in, a, in a comedy uh, thing. I remember David Frost just mentioned my name in a Raw Variety performance. The bloody audience laughed. No, you, j- did you, no well, joke necessary. How did that affect you and your family? Did you ever think that moving away, or did you think to yourself, I can't handle this? Were you ever suicidal or anything, David? No, absolutely uh, not. Um, I, I, I'm, I, I'm a stubborn bugger, me. Mm-hmm. And, and the, more, the more you tell me what I can't say, the more I'll say it. The more you tell me what I can't do, I'll do it. And uh, uh, um, uh, but there was there was something. Obviously, you've got confusion. What the hell is happening to me? What's happening? But there's a there was a core beyond that that somehow just knew this was going to be okay, and it was leading somewhere. And just some knowing you can't really explain. And I I'll tell I I'll tell you a story, a true story. I'm I'm sitting on I'm sitting in the seat on the Wogan show, and he's talking to me. And the audience are laughing. And, and David Icke, the experiencer, experience rather, not the experiencer, the experience, was, was dying. But something, something beyond that was saying to me, as it was happening, this is leading somewhere. It's going to be okay. It's going to be fine. It's going to okay, be okay. And that, 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 wherever that was coming from, that kind of kept me going through all this period of ridicule. And, you know, I didn't know at that point, of course, some of the things that I was going to be talking about. I didn't know what was coming and what was going to be uncovering and all that stuff. Some of the things on that show, David, you, you, you covered because you went back on the Wogan show, which you did apologise for. It came through, yeah. some of the stuff. So... Again, that's shown that you stood up for what you believed in. It did come true. What do you think, David, as humans, who are we as individuals? Who are we as people? Why are we on this planet, do you think? Well, let's put this planet into, and this experience, into context, which is something you almost never hear. We have unbelievable numbers of television channels, radio channels now, 24-7, beaming out, all over the world, all the time. How often, comparatively, do you see programs about the nature of reality? Actually, actually, who are we? What is this place? What are we doing here? Surely that would be at the center of questioning, but it's not. It's marginalized because if you have a population that is living a reality which actually doesn't exist, but they experience it as if it does, you've already put them in a cul-de-sac of perception. And that's where you want them. If the few are going to control the many, you can't have an enlightened population. You've got to have an ignorant population that believes in things that aren't real. Um, And that's why you hit so many lies pour out of politics, because they're trying to get the population to believe something that's not true. But this is a much deeper level of it, Let's get them to believe in a reality that's not true, while the very few, not the politicians, or overwhelmingly ignorant as anyone else, in fact, more so, <laughs> um, but at the core, in the shadows, they understand how reality works, and they want the population not to know. That's why you don't have this, uh, who are we, where are we, how does all this work, um, uh, discussed in, in, in any uh, length, or I- I- even at all, mostly, in, in the media. But let's put this into perspective. If I said to most people, if you look into this room, can you see everything in the room, everything in the space that you're looking at? They go, well, yeah, of course I can. No, you can't. Four, five dimensions. Yeah. The- um, according to mainstream science, um, the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, which is basically the reality we live in, um, is naught point naught naught five percent of what exists in the universe and the universe is only one construct within infinity um and visible light which is the only frequency band that we can see everything we see visually is within this band visible light is a smear of the 0.005 percent some say it's a bit more uh, as much as 0.5 percent but negligible whatever um and therefore what we're not actually living in a world we're living in a band of frequency tiny 
which contains an informational field or fields. And we are interacting with those informational fields, just like a computer interacts with Wi-Fi. And we are decoding those informational fields into what appears to be, and we experience as, a solid world. Oh, oh there you go. <laughs> there you go. There's a bit of synchronicity. synchronicity for you there. So as human beings, who do you think put us here? Are we, are we the aliens? Are we computers? Are we... What is the question I should be asking here? Because it's I think about it all the time. Who the fuck are we? Who am I? What am I here for? And are we... Are we come from apes? Are we fish? Are we... There's so many questions you can ask no, about no, it. What's true? No, what's real? What's no, fake? We, we, we don't come from apes. That's another mm -hmm. kind of... Because there's apes still here if you're... If yeah. It's... Um, but, you know, uh, when, when you follow that story back, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a nonsense. But it's a great diversion from um, what's actually going on. Um, because are we computers... At the level of consciousness, no. See, if you said to me, who are you? I would say I am awareness. I am a state of being aware. Forget the body. Forget everything. In my base form, I am a, a state of awareness. I am a point of attention within an infinite um, stream of awareness. And you are a point of attention in the same stream of awareness, and so is everybody else. But your point of attention, uh, which is influenced by your life experience, sees the world in a certain way, and my point of attention sees it in a certain way. But we're all together points of attention within the same stream of consciousness. This is what makes racism and sexism and all these isms utterly nonsensical unfortunately if you want to find racists then go and find anti-racists because mm -hmm. anti-racists are obsessed with what race they see race everywhere in other words we're back to the labels they see labels everywhere you are a that race label you are a that race label no doesn't matter if you're black, white, or sky blue, pink. They're just vehicles for experience, transitory experiences. Um, do, you, do you think we, 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 are, we are Muslim or black or white or Hindu when we leave the body? Of course not. That, that's, that, these, are, these are belief systems within this tiny band of frequency we call um, the world. And because we self-identify with them, instead of just enjoying them, you know, I like being a Muslim. I like being a white guy. I like being a black guy. Okay, fine. It's an experience. Enjoy. But don't think it's you. Because once you think your labels are you, bang. Um, and so what, I, uh, what, the, what transformed my life is when I started to understand this and I started to self-identify, not with David Icke as who I am, but as what I'm experiencing, but what I am is consciousness, having the experience. That's what's leaving the body at what we call a near-death experience. When people leave the body, they've got no eyes, but they can still see. They've got no brain, but they can still think. It's because um, they are consciousness, and consciousness has the ability to, to hear, think, everything. But the, the body, what the body does, you, you, you think of... Um, consciousness consciousness does not if you like vibrate it's not within the frequency band of this reality we're experiencing so it's like uh radio one radio two radio three or four are all sharing the same space but they don't interfere with each other why because because they're not on the same frequency so consciousness is not on, uh, in the range of frequency that we are directly experiencing in what we call the physical world. So to experience these, this band of frequency, this reality, the, our consciousness takes on an, what we call an external form, which is operating within the frequency band of this world. And because of that, I can pick that glass up. My consciousness could not pick that glass up because it's on a completely different frequency to the glass. But, but operating through this, this outer shell, what I call a biological computer, um, it can pick the glass up because the, there, 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 there are compatible frequencies. Um, do you think, and, sorry, David, do you think there's other species on this planet? 
because you've spoken about that very quite a lot. You've wrote over 20 books. Do you think there's other people walking among us as well? Oh, well, well, well absolutely. I, I mean, let, let, let's put this again into, uh, into context. Uh, according to mainstream science, if you compare the size of planet Earth with the size of the projected size of the universe, planet Earth is the equivalent of a billionth of a pinhead. So if you say that life as we know it only exists on a billionth of a pinhead within the greater reality, you are, well, yeah, yeah, well, that's credible. You, you, you could be an academic saying that, but you say, actually, hold on a minute, elephant, living room, sofa, billionth of a pinhead, night sky, which is a tiny fraction even of one galaxy, and there's billions of galaxies in the universe, they say now, Despite all that, life is... Oh, oh. I'm having a problem. <laughs> that microphone's getting a we baffle. We're out, uh, Mike. Um, but um, we're saying that uh, life as we know it only exists on a billionth of a pinhead and nowhere else. I mean, it's insanity. And then you think this. Look at the vastness of different forms that exist in animals, in insects, in, in nature, in all of it, even in, in the human race. Look at someone from China or someone from Asia or someone from South America, from South Africa, from, from, from Europe. Look, look at the differences. You look at the range of form, of different form and expressions of form that exist within um, a smear of 0.05% of the universe. What the heck in the infinity beyond this reality, which is in almost the entirety of everything, what the heck exists out there in terms of form, but, and different expressions of consciousness. How do we know what's out there, David? See, I'm a man who questions everything. Unless I see it with my own eyes, I struggle to believe it. And people say, oh, I don't believe in conspiracy theories. And we touched on it earlier. Everything's a conspiracy because unless you see it with your own eyes, or everything, it's the way you perceive things, or your perception. How do we actually know what's out there? How do we know we're not in a snow globe? How do we know the world's not flat or round? How, how do we know the answers? Well, 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 basically, you don't in terms of, you know, every I uh, dotted and every T crossed. All you can do is um, put the information that you uh, come have across. together and come to conclusions. That's that's all you can you can really do. But, you know... When I'm talking about um, non-human uh, non-human races interacting with and manipulating human society, I've not sat in a darkened room and pulled it out the bloody ether, um, <laughs> at smoking a weed. I, I, I've been to more than sixty countries over thirty mm. years researching this. I've talked to um, whistleblowers on the inside of the American uh, military and uh, intelligence complex. Many of them. I've talked to shamans around the world who uh, are carriers of the ancient knowledge of those societies. And when you put what the two say together, you, you, you get the same answer that, yes, there is a non-human force that is manipulating human society. And, and you see it in ancient accounts. You see um, the common themes around the world in different cultures describing the same thing. Um, and you see... One common theme, for instance, which is that this non-human force manipulated human genetics. This um, uh, uh, comes out in, in, in the Old Testament, for instance, as the sons of God who interbred with the daughters of men. People say, oh, that's, a, that's, a, that, that's in the Bible. Well, yes, it is, but, but the theme is everywhere in, in non-Bible countries galore, uh, cultures galore. Um, and, and so you put it all together and, and, and you come to conclusions. Then you write it down, you connect the dots, and then you put it out and then people decide whether they want to believe it or not. That's, that's, the, that, that's the deal. But, um, you know, when you look at how narrow the band is that we can see and perceive, um, I don't, I, I, my, my, um, my experience over the last 30 years says to me, that's not an accident. Mm -hmm. Somehow, human genetics has been manipulated to only perceive a very narrow band of reality, which makes us obviously far more controllable. Um, and you, talk, you always talk about being controlled. They're talking about, you spoke about it years ago, David, about kids getting microchipped 
and now we're getting microchipped yeah. where they can follow us about and the Illuminati. Can you touch on that? The people who, the small percentage of the people who control the world. Well, um, one of the things that uh, you know is a head shaker to me, and I smile to myself these days, is over the years, people have told me, authority has told me, authority is trying to tell me even more now that I'm wrong, and because I'm wrong, I can't say what I'm saying and write what I'm writing. And then they proved me bloody right. <laughs> you know, I, I said, I said uh, back, in the, back in the 90s when I was producing the first books that there was a plan for the world, and that plan included the destruction of freedom of speech and the creation of a centrally controlled global fascist, communist, Marxist, whatever you want to call it, state. They're all different terms for the same tyranny. Um, that this included microchipping the population. Um, don't even start me on that. It's way, way, way uh, along the line already. Um, and that um, money would be taken out of circulation, so only cashless uh, uh, money would, uh, digital money would uh, be used, which has fundamental implications for freedom and control. And a stream of other things which have all come true. And the reason I could do that is very simple. Um, how did Aldous Huxley, in 1932, in his book Brave New World, how was he able to describe genetic drug uh, and other things that, uh, in a dystopian way that is now happening? How could um, George Orwell be so accurate in 1948? What about the other people that I... Um, quote in my books, insiders way back who were saying this is what's going to happen because this is the plan. And it's all happening in detail, not even theme, detail, because there is a plan, there is a script. And what I've done for the last 30 years is work to uncover what that is. And once you do, once you know what's planned, predicting the future is, is quite straightforward that's why so many, uh, you know, uh, I, I see my books from the 1990s read on the TV news every day now um, in changes in society. It's because uh, I have this phrase, know the outcome and you'll see the journey. If you don't know what the outcome is planned to be, then what happens in the world, in world events and daily happenings, appear to be random. They seem to have no pattern. They seem to have no rhyme and reason. They just happen. Or, or they, you blame them on something else. When you know what the outcome is planned to be, which is what I've been uncovering all these years, then you start to see that these apparently random events are not random at all. They are stepping stones towards the outcome. You talk about, we talk about freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is being systematically destroyed. Uh, and uh, I'll give you the outcome on that. The outcome, uh, desired outcome, is that there comes a point... Um, which we're moving towards so fast, when no one will ever see or hear anything that is not acceptable to the um, authorities, to, to the system. Uh, and we are seeing now daily um, freedom of speech and censorship being increased and increased and increased towards that desired outcome of deleting all information that the authorities don't want people to see. Now, what's been happening? The internet was actually created by this cabal. We can talk about that if you like, about you know, why that was and where, where it's going. But one of the reasons is that they wanted to put all information eventually that people receive and where they get their information, thus their perceptions, which come from information received, that's what perceptions are, from the internet digitally. And the reason they want to do that is because once it's digital, then you can use algorithms to censor. You don't even need, need human input. Once the codes are in place, the algorithms, as they're doing now, will censor what people can see and hear. Now, what is freedom of speech? It's the freedom to speak. And if you have the freedom to speak, then you have the ability to challenge the prevailing narrative. And thus, you're never in a situation where people only see and hear what the authorities want you to see and hear. For that to be uh, reached, that situation, free speech has to be deleted. 
Otherwise, they're not going to get there. That's why free speech is being deleted. And uh, George Orwell had this, this concept of freedom, in effect, being the ability to say that two and two equals four. Because while you, can, you have the right to say two and two equals four, you have the right to freedom of speech. You have the right to speak factually and not be de um, censored, even though you're speaking fact, but they're wrong facts from the authorities' point of view. And in 1984, in the book, um, society moved to a point where they, they were told they had to believe that two and two equaled five. Uh, and you couldn't say two and two equal four anymore. You had to believe that two and two equal five because that's what the authority wanted you to believe so they got the outcome that they wanted. And what happens is that initially, and we're in that point now, when you're being pressured to believe two and two equals five and to say it and not contradict it, there is a resistance which says, well, it's a load of bloody nonsense. Two and two does it even equal five. But when you then start giving people consequences for not accepting two or two equals five, abuse, losing your job, all the rest of it, marginalization, people then start in search of self-respect. They, they don't want to accept that what they're doing is being kowtowed into saying two and two equals five when they know it's four. So they start to convince themselves two and two equals five. So it becomes not their enforced reality eventually, it becomes their perceived reality. And, some, so, and suddenly the world's gone freaking mad. And that is absolutely the process that's happening now. What level of madness, mate, have we reached when professors of biology are being investigated by their universities and abused by students for saying that men and women are biologically different? Men and women are biologically different, okay? Men and women are biologically different. Another way of putting it, two and two equals four. But the uh, so-called progressive, they're not at all, the fascistic, Marxist, whichever term you want to use, progressive, narcissistic um, stormtroopers, of political correctness, Twitter stormtroopers, um, are insisting that you believe two and two equals five. And it's a very simple thing. If you want something to happen, which, if you had an open debate, you couldn't win it, and therefore it couldn't happen, you simply don't have the debate. And, you know, I have, I have a phrase, you know, if you want to know and see the, the foundation elements of this agenda of human mass control, look at the subjects you cannot have another opinion about. Look at the subjects where if you have a different opinion to the official narrative, you're going to get abuse, ridicule, and other consequences. That's the agenda. Shut you up. Simply, simply for this reason. If you can't win a debate on facts, and of course, men and women are not biologically different, it's not a debate you can win on facts, then you don't have the debate. You shout down, abuse uh, people who have that. And uh, we were talking beforehand. I posted something on my website today, which I saw this morning, where there's a, there's a, a, a meeting at a university in America, and there's speakers uh, there, and a woman stands, uh, well, she didn't stand up, she was sitting down, but a woman spoke, uh, one of the speakers, um, uh, who, who was kind of a, 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 an academic in her field. And she said, well, it's obviously that there are biological differences between men and women, because if you look at the facts, um, F-A-C-T-S, I think that's spelt, people will forget that soon, um, then the vast majority of men are taller than women um women have different uh, uh have fat in different places they have different muscular uh, uh um uh, types people in the audience started walking out she's just saying the bloody obvious and they're walking out why she's saying two and two equals four they believe two and two equals five and, and they insist everyone else does cameraman follows them out and they're out in the lobby saying that's facet that's fascist 
We can't sit and listen to that fascism. What? That men and women are biologically different? This is where um, we are going. And this is why it's so important that people are not intimidated into silence. Because I meet so many people who say, yeah, it's a load of nonsense, but, you know, what, look what happens if you, if you say so. And, and, you know, one of my roles, if you like, is of being the kid um, pointing at the naked emperor while everyone's sycophantically hovering around saying, wonderful new clothes, emperor. Oh, what a lovely jacket. And I'm saying, hold on a minute. The guy's freaking naked. <laughs> Got no bloody clothes on. What are you talking about? <laughs> and that, of course, is two and two equals four. Do you think people are too scared now to speak out? Well, they it? are. And it's systematic. It's being done systematically to, people. To, to shut people up. What is political correctness? I'll give you it in a line. It's manipulating the target population to silence itself. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. And false flag events, David, you've, you've blew the whistle on a couple of them. What is a false flag event, uh, event for people who don't know? Well, one of the things that I, one of the phrases I came up with that has now come into quite common parlance um, in the alternative media anyway, I came up with it in uh, the 1990s, was problem, reaction, solution. This is so important. There's, there's two mass manipulation techniques because this is the bottom line. This conspiracy is a conspiracy to psychologically program the population. <clears throat> Why do people behave the way they do? Why does someone behave that way and someone behave that way? Perception. That person's perception leads them to um, behave that way. This person's perception leads them to, to behave this way. Um, and where does perception come from? Information received. People process information received and they, they reach their perception. So if you can control information received, you control perception, you control behavior. This is what happens when you control information. And if you control it totally, which is where they're going, as I've just talked about, then you eventually control behavior totally because you're controlling all perception. What um, problem, reaction, solution, and its stablemate, what I call the totalitarian tiptoe, are are psychological manipulation techniques, and they're used on us all the time. Problem, reaction, solution. Other people call it false flag. You want to change the world in a certain way, and you know that if you stand up and openly say, this is what we're going to do, you're going to get a big resistance against it. People are going to say, we're not having that. What's going on? We're not, what are you doing that for? There's no reason. So what you do is you give them a reason. Stage one, you create a problem. Could be a terrorist attack. It could be a, a, a financial collapse. Could be a government collapse. Could be whatever. Um, you then tell the population via an unquestioning and pathetic mainstream media the version of that problem you want them to believe. You name the villain. You name the reason for why that problem uh, is happening when you, in the shadows, have actually made it happen. At stage two of problem, reaction, solution, you want a reaction from the public of outrage, of fear, of whatever the reaction is required. And then you want them to, in effect, say, do something, something must be done. And then those who've created the problem covertly and blamed someone else and got you... Um, to believe it, then offer the solutions to the problems they've created. And they are solutions that push on this agenda for the world of more and more control, more and more centralization of power, um, more and more uh, dictatorship. Um, and they, they can make that happen with a solution to a manufactured problem that they couldn't have done without the problem. And um, so how much freedom has been taken away because of terrorist attacks. Well, what if, what if not every one, but what if many of those terrorist attacks were actually not what they appeared to be, but were actually orchestrated by the very system that wants to change society? Um, and, uh, you know, this create the problem, offer the solution, is happening all the time. And that links in with something else I've mentioned, the totalitarian tiptoe. You're at A and you want to take the world to Z. 
you know if you go in too big a leap towards Z, the change is going to be so dramatic that people are going to look up from the game show or the, or the sport and say, what's happening? So you go as far as you can, as fast as you can, but not so far that you alert too many people to the fact that there's a pattern here. Um, and so um, you have a problem reaction solution and you take a step, deleting freedom, de uh, more surveillance, more control. Then you have another problem reaction solution and you do it more and you do it more and you do it more. If you look at um, the European Union, it's a classic totalitarian tiptoe. We were um, told we were joining a, uh, a free trade area called the common market, good for jobs. Okay, that's where it starts. But they, that's not where they was planned to finish. That was just the foot in the door. And then you have more and more centralization of power. Well, if we centralize power, it would be more efficient. You know, over this and over that and over that and all that stuff. And then it goes on and on and on until we've reached the point now where Europe is controlled in fine detail by a handful of bureaucrats that the vast majority of people in Europe couldn't even name. And, and I had to smile the other, the, other, the other month. In my books in the 1990s, I said the plan is for a European army, an EU army. Oh, load of rubbish. We've got NATO. Ridiculous. Now, last few months, Merkel and, uh, in uh, Germany and Macron in France, who are just puppets of this whole thing, like May and, and Trump and all of them, um, they've come out and said, we've had an idea. We've had an idea. We should have a European army. What do you mean you've had an idea? How did I know about it in 1993? How much stuff have you said, David, that's came through? Does it scare you, the stuff that has came through, and go, I fucking told you so? Do you sit back and go, told you's? No, I don't. Uh, what, well, what, what, I, what I do is I point out when things happen that I said them, but I don't, um, uh, way back, but I don't say, see, told you so. I do it for a reason, and this reason. If I knew about it 20, 30 years ago, it's not random, is it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not just happening. It's planned. Otherwise, I couldn't have known it. How could Orwell have known it? How could Huxley have known it? And these other people that I quote, how could they have known it? How could someone I quote in, in the books, a Rockefeller, big time Rockefeller insider, have described the internet that was coming in 1969? How could he have done that? How could he have said in 1969, we are going to make boys and girls the same? How, how would he have known that? Because there's a plan and it's projected much further ahead than people think the realize. plan for the people controlling the world maybe are 100 years ahead, 200 years uh, ahead. Yeah, because, because it, it, it's another big story. Once you, once you go off into another force that's not human, their timeline and their projections are not the same that, that, that we live in, where we, you know, if, if you're going down a river on a canoe, you see as far as the next turn in the river. But what if there's a force that can see the whole the whole river all the, from start to finish? Yeah. Then they have a completely different timeline and a, diff, a completely different ability to project the future. How did George Orwell know about smart TVs? Don't smart know. TVs, and we're only seeing Mark One, Two, Three at the moment, not where they're planned to go. They have cameras in them and microphones in them that film you in, can film you in your front room and record your conversations in your front room well admit it's, it's admitted it, you know somebody found them and then they had to admit that it was true in, in 1984 which came out in 1948 george orwell was talking about in in the 1984 society that um there were telescreens in every home and the telescreens were constantly filming you the big brothers watching big brothers well. watching so because it's a projected, uh, projected long into the future, if you can access that, either because you're an insider or, or you know, 30 years of bloody research full time, then you can, you can predict the future. Because the simple thing is, if nothing intervenes to stop that process unfolding, that will happen. So you can predict the future. Mm -hmm. The whole point of what I do is to alert enough people eventually to all these things, that there is an intervention. And it is stopped because a few people, and it is a few in full knowledge in the shadows, cannot manipulate and direct the lives of 7.7 .7 billion um, uh, uh, because they don't have the numbers. To do it, 
they have to manipulate the perceptions of the population, which becomes the behavior of the population. Thus, the population behaves in a way that the few can control the many. And the key factor above all other factors is to keep that target population in complete ignorance of what you're doing. And so the more that you can uncover it and communicate it and people become aware that this is happening and thus events in the world are happening because of this and not randomly, the more uh, chance there is of an intervention and the population saying, we're not having it. The, the people you've spoke out against, David, are the most powerful people in the world. Do you ever get scared that they'll take away your life, that they'll put a hit out in you or they'll try and shut you up? Because they've tried so many times to shut you up. They've now banned you from Australia. Yeah. Do you ever feel that, shit, I'm in danger here? Have you ever felt your life in danger? from the higher powers and the people who control the world? Never crosses my mind. No. I mean, that might, might be hard for people to believe, but it's true, it never crosses my mind. Uh, and, and for this reason, A, we're more powerful when we take our power back than ever we believe we are. And, you know, I, I look on these people as pathetic little boys in short trousers, little boys and girls in short trousers, because um, what kind of psychopathic insanity does it take to want to impose your will over a vast population of people? I mean, it's pathetic. They are pathetic. I'm going to be frightened of, the, of them. Are you, are you having a laugh? No way. And this is, the other point is this. Once you um, start self-identifying with being consciousness, that's my eternal state, your eternal state, everyone's eternal state, consciousness, a state of awareness, well, whether it's in this body, it'll be out of this body eventually anyway at some point. Whether it's in this body or not in this body is, is almost irrelevant because it's always a state of consciousness having an experience of some kind. So the worst that can happen to me is that I leave this body, right? And I will eventually anyway. I don't want to stay here forever, my God. Um, and, um, I mean, you can have too much of a good thing, can't you? Uh, so... It never crosses my mind. Um, if you're taken out, you're taken out. But you're taken out trying to do the right thing. And Which it's, takes courage. Well, do you think now, David? Well, courage, courage is overcoming fear, mm -hmm. which is a really powerful thing, courage overcoming fear. When you let go of fear, you don't need courage. You just do it. It's not like, you know, if I say, I've just written a book, I've just finished it. It's going to be probably the most controversial book, certainly given current, times probably going to be one of the most controversial books ever written um and and so i know what's coming with it but i don't fear it You're used to it well, i don't fear it because i'm putting out what i believe to be right um and i don't need courage to put it out because i don't fear putting it out because don't fear the reaction the reaction is what it is uh so I, you react to it yeah, and, and a lot of people are a popular, a lot of people are going to read it and go, "Thank God, someone's saying it at last." Mm -hmm. and, and the system's going to say, "Ban him, condemn him." Couldn't get. Do less. you think they're doing the same thing with Jim Carrey now that they did with you thirty years ago? Try to ridicule him and call him crazy and say all the bad shit towards him because he's kind of had a spiritual awakening. He wants to stay away from the media and do. He's in the woods and just try to heal himself and get away from the false shit that was involved in for so long? Well, I, I, I spent an evening with Jim Carrey, actually, at his home um, with my son Jamie uh, some years ago when I was in L.A., uh, and we had a very interesting chat. Um, and again, J Jim Carrey's had a, an experience similar to me where, where basically the bubble popped and the veil lifted. And um, it can be a challenging time because suddenly you're, you're perceiving another reality that's so different to the one you've been perceiving before. And, of course, when you start talking about it, for reasons we've discussed, you're going to get ridiculed for, by the mainstream. Um, the trick is not to care. And from what I've seen of Jim, he don't care. And, you know, you know people just thought... Uh, Look at, look at this, the range of things you perceive. Is that really the limit 
of what there is to perceive? Is that really the limit of what there is to know? Is that the limit of ways of seeing the subjects you have views about? Well, of course not. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction. Anybody's views are a tiny fraction of possibility. So why aren't we exploring all possibility? Not that you, you, you come across information and just because you come across it, oh, that's true, then I'll believe that now. No, you question it, you, you process it, you come to conclusions about it. But it's, it's very simple, and history shows us this, systematically reducing the amount of information views and diversity of information and views available to people never ends up well <laughs> it never turns out good it always turns out bad for humanity because you look at any tyranny fascist tyranny communist tyranny whatever it is whenever they get power they want to de destroy all alternative information and view that challenges what they want people to believe every time. So whenever you're in a situation where the free flow of information and view and opinion is being censored, you are in a tyranny. And what humanity has allowed itself, not everybody, of course, but great numbers, especially the political correctness group is, is they've allowed themselves to become a tyranny while claiming to be anti-tyranny. I see anti-fascist protests full of people acting fascistically because they're so far up their own arse and so full <laughs> of their own um, self-purity, they don't realize that what they're doing is actually projecting their own behavior um, in, in what they're um, opposing. Anyone who gives someone a hard time for having a different view, however much they may not agree with it, is a psychological fascist, in my view, because they are seeking to um, impose their will on someone else. And uh, it's uh, quite simple. You let all information be circulated and then people make their own minds up what they want to believe and what they don't believe. And this is a key. Um, what we're seeing now, not least through algorithms uh, and, and through self-censorship by being intimidated into, into being terrified of speaking your truth, we're seeing information censored before the point of delivery, before anyone can hear it. This is fundamental because I, I believe that all information and all views should be allowed to be expressed uh, because if anyone is censored from expressing those beliefs, then no one has freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is freedom of speech, the freedom to speak. It's not freedom to speak what is acceptable, it's the freedom to speak. And once anyone is censored, freedom of speech is dead because what's left is only what is acceptable to speak. And that's not freedom of speech. And then what they've done and what they're doing all the time is squeezing that acceptability. So freedom of speech gets narrower and narrower until it disappears altogether. And so what we have um, is uh, a situation where if people are allowed to say and communicate whatever they want, that is a situation where no authority in any form has the power to decide what people see and hear. Once you start censoring before the point of delivery, which is to say algorithms and self-censorship is now doing, you are giving authority the power to decide what people see and hear. And of course, it starts out with one excuse. We must stop jihadis, um, you know, justifying or promoting violence okay oh fake news fake news what's fake news whatever we say it is uh yeah we've got to stop people saying fake news so we're going to censor that oh um the more people we can get to be uh victims and upset the more excuses we've got to censor even more right yeah so give people all the excuses they want to be upset 
and to be feel a victim, and then we can censor people saying things that upset them, and so you're moving along this road. None of that can happen when we have the free flow of information, nothing censored. So people say, well, what about, you know, saying go and kill people? Yeah, but there's laws against that. There's laws against that. There's laws against telling people, oh, burn that house down. But they're after the point of delivery, which means you can deal with um, the extremes of what how people use speech, but it's, it's heard. Mm -hmm. Then you can deal with it if it needs dealing with it. And most speech does not need dealing with it at all. You know, come on, let's go and kill this person. Well, obviously, um, you know, you deal with that. You have to deal with that. But it's after the point of delivery. And as long as we hold that line, authority has no power to censor. What we're seeing now is the opposite of that. That beyond, before that line is, is, is where most censorship is starting to happen and thus freedom is disappearing. What do you think the biggest cover-up on this planet is, David, for your perspective? Oh, I think the biggest cover-up is the conspiracy in totality. Um, because, you know, people say to me sometimes, uh, you seem to see conspiracies everywhere. I don't. See one conspiracy with multiple faces and multiple facets not the same as seeing conspiracies everywhere. Um, and it's simply this, that there is a cabal that wants to create a situation, which I've been saying since the 1990s and early 1990s, and look at it now, where we have a world government, a world central bank, the world government dictating to every community on earth, a world central bank dictating all finance, a world single digital currency, um, which means that through algorithms and even you know human input, you can wipe someone's bank account away because there's no cash in that society. You think you've got money? <laughs> there you go. You can do it. You can do it. Um, very simply, it's control. You go into a shop now and you hand over... Um, a credit card, electronic money, and they say, sorry, won't accept your card, you can still pay cash. When there's no cash and they say, won't accept your card or your microchip as it's meant to be eventually, then whoever controls the computer controls if you have the ability to purchase anything. Uh, so that's all about control. They want a world army to impose the will of the world government, and that is um, uh, ex the expansion, expansion of NATO. This European army is all part of that, that they're proposing. Um, uh, and they want a microchipped uh, population connected to a global computer system, actually what, what is, what is uh, known as the smart grid. Um, you know, this technological society uh, is a Trojan horse of monumental proportions. And if people remember nothing, they should uh, remember this. They're now openly talking, people like Ray Kurzweil at um, the Google executive, you know, Google, Facebook, all these organizations, Amazon, they're all controlled by the same force to the same end. That's why they're becoming monopolies but dictating to people what they can see and hear and all that stuff. Um, it's all planned. But um, what Ray Kurzweil is talking about now, and people like him, is that by around the year 2030, humanity will be, have their brains connected to artificial intelligence. And he's very open about it. Uh, as um, this goes on, artificial intelligence will do more and more of human thinking until human thinking as we know it now is basically negligible. In other words, you'll be a computer terminal on someone else's internet. And the reason they're being so open about it is the, is the sales pitch, which is um, you'll be superhuman if, if, if you do this. And what you'll be is subhuman and human consciousness, human thought human emotion as we've known it will be over because every thought every emotional response will come from ai he who controls ai will then control every human's perceptions directly who is connected to ai and we've been taken along a very clear uh process to take us to that point 
stage one, see, I'm coming up 67. And I'm glad I was born when I have, doing what I'm doing now, because I have a radar. I can remember what the world was like before. People born into it. You see, when you get born into the world, the world appear, you, you think the world is how it is because you're born into it. This is how it is, okay? But it's not how it always was. And when you're born into the world as it is, you, you don't really have so much of a compass to, to get a fix on the world as it is because it's just how it is. When you were born before it, it, it is as it is now, you have a compass, you have a comparison. You can see the scale, the stunning scale of the change, not least since this technological society kicked in and, and then went kind of on steroids. Stage one, you get the population addicted to technology they can hold. Well, basically achieved, smartphones, tablets, etc. And you target especially the young. Why? Because they're going to be the adults at the point you want to bring in this full-blown AI-controlled human. You want them so addicted and obsessed with technology that, as happens now, on, on, on one expression of it, they'll get up in the middle of the night and go and um, queue in the dark outside an Apple bloody store to get the first version of the new thing. Uh, get them addicted enough and they'll queue up waiting to be connected to AI, right? So that's why they're targeting the young. Stage two, because what you want to do, you want to get in the body. And if they went directly to the body without anything in between, people would go, what's going on? Totalitarian tiptoe, you see. So the next stage is on the body, what they call wearables, holdables to wearables. This is your, your Apple Watch and your Bluetooth and all these gadgets now that people wear that are connected to the internet. And then you go to the next stage, which is in the body. I spoke uh, a little while ago last year in Sweden, and people, um, thousands of people now in Sweden are being microchipped um, and, and, and queuing up for it, having parties to celebrate. <laughs> Ethel's been microchipped. <laughs> um, and, and, and this is what happens with addiction. Um, it's called addiction for a reason. You were addicted. And so this, is, this has been the um, process that is taking us along here, kitty, 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 here, kitty, 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 along this road to the point <clears throat> where they want to introduce fully blown AI controlled humans. This is where it's going and it's within the lifetime, well within the lifetime of people alive today. Even those that aren't young, it's within their lifetimes too. And, and, and all these diversions, look here, look here, smell this, look at this, hear this, are all to stop us going, deep breath, take a step back, look at it again shite look what they're doing and that's what i'm doing you know i'm i'm pointing this out i'm saying over here see sofa elephant elephant not giraffe elephant <laughs> there it is before we finish up david um i want to touch on how how true is the harp the weather control how true is that 100 percent. yeah what is weather it's energy they're in it what is the weather? It's electromagnetic information fields. So there's something out there that controls the weather. The harp is it a harp system? The harp effect? Well, the harp in Alaska is uh, is one of them. Um, they're called ionosphere heaters, um, but there's many of them now, and they are high powered uh, radio frequency technology that manipulates the electromagnetic field of the planet, and within that electromagnetic field. Um, is are the fields of energy that that we call weather so if you can manipulate those fields to act in different ways you can manipulate the weather you can create hurricanes you can create tornadoes you know what a tornado is it's a fast rotating electromagnetic field that's all it is that's why they appear during electrical storms it's electromagnetic fields spinning and you can spin electromagnetic fields and create um uh, tornadoes you can manipulate the field so that rain doesn't manifest. You can create a drought or you can, you can make rain manifest massively and you can, you can get floods. This is, this, is, this is what you can do. In fact, I'll give you just a very quick um, example going way back um, to, what was it, the 50s? 50s, I think it was, 60s, 50s, I think it was. Um, there was a rainstorm in... Um, place called Lynmouth in Devon 
that was so fantastic in such a short time that the river that comes down, actually the stream, not really a river, down through the town into the sea, was a vast wall of water that killed a great number of people. I think it was, it was 1952 keeps coming to mind. Destroyed so many houses, devastated the place. And it was 250 times the rainfall that would be expected in that area, right? All these years later, decades and decades later, BBC Radio, to be fair, they don't do many good investigations, <laughs> but this was one. They did an investigation program that established that the RAF had flown over that area just before and they'd sent out chemicals into the clouds that stimulated rain. It was an experiment. So that's chemtrails? Well, that's chemtrails, um, which are, of course, they come out the back of planes and not contrails because they, they disappear because they're based on condensation and heat. Um, chemtrails come out of the plane and don't disappear. They just pan out and eventually fall to earth. Well, they're full of lots of things. Um, and, and yes, they are indirectly affecting the, uh, affecting the weather and affecting many other things. I, 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 my last book was called Everything You Need to Know and have never been, But Have Never Been Told, and it goes into some of this in detail that we're talking about now and all the other stuff we talked about. Um, but manipulating the weather is, um, is, is, is very straightforward these days uh, through technology. Uh, but... Remember, I said they manipulate the weather by manipulating electromagnetic fields that dictate the weather. The body, the brain, is an expression of electromagnetic fields and electrical circuits. Technologically generated electromagnetic fields and electrical circuits, Wi-Fi, phone communications this lethal stuff they're bringing in now which is actually a weapon called 5g are fundamentally impacting upon the electromagnetic fields of the body which affect people psychologically and which affect them quote physically and emotionally it's why you get so many people who are close to these towers that suffer from depression it's because they're being affected by the electromagnetic, technological electromagnetic impact on their, their field, which expresses itself psychologically in terms of emotion, in terms of physicality. And the body's electromagnetic fields, um, when they're in a balanced, harmonious state, equal physical health, a lack of dis-ease, disharmony, when you start impacting upon the, the, the balance of that field, you create disharmony, and through that, you get physical dis-ease, which is just an expression of electromagnetic disease. disharmony. Disease causes disease. Uh, this, is what, this is why people that, that work or live close to these sources of electromagnetic energy, be they phone towers or, 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 or whatever, um, are so... Um, they get cancers that are very rare in the population because they have certain effects that go on. This is why radiation is dangerous. This is why radiation affects you. And of course, what we're living in now, almost everywhere, is a, a permanent state of, of walking, living, and breathing through electromagnetic, technologically generated fields. Do you think there's a cure for everything, David? Eh? Do you think there's a cure for everything? Of course there is. Yeah. If everything can go wrong, can go right. everything can go right. It's just finding out what can go right. And if you are the mainstream medical profession, which is basically just an extension of the pharmaceutical industry, it's all it is, um, then you are not given the full range of possibility to treat dis-ease, disharmony. You're given the scalpel and the drug. In other words, you're given a bloody hammer. And you're told that every human problem, be it psychological, emotional, or physical, is a freaking nail. And so 
Oh, what have you got? Oh, I'm depressed. Oh, over here. Bang. There you go. You get you you you'll get that at the drugstore. Mm. What do you uh, think? If you know, this is what David? it goes on. You know, uh, this is what happened. And, and because the medical profession is just another expression of the postage stamp consensus, as I call it, this narrow band of information that people not only believe in, but are forced in terms of the medical profession to believe in. Because you, you want to. I know people, doctors who've realized that alternative methods of healing are better than what they, they do, the scalpel and the drug, they've been struck off for using them, even though it benefits the pa patient, because the pharmaceutical industry controls the medical profession. Um, this, is, this is why now we're seeing this um, war on um, the circulation of information challenging the official story of vaccines. <clears throat> this is why YouTube is demonetizing and deleting same with Amazon and, and, and Facebook, um, information that's challenging the official story of vaccines. One of the reasons in the immigration minister's diatribe in Australia, saying why my visa is going to be revoked four hours before my plane left for Australia and like months and months after I was given it, was my views on vaccines. So, and my views on climate change caused by humans, which it isn't. Um, climate's always freaking changed. Um, but that means that in Australia, in a society that believes it's free, um, you, the pharmaceutical industry that makes billions and billions of pounds out of vaccines can say what it likes about vaccines. But me, from me, me one bedroom flat on the Isle of Wight, <laughs> can't go to Australia and give a different view. Now, we're back to something else. Why, why are, is the Australian government, which, which is an asset of the pharmaceutical industry like all of them, why is it so terrified of me? Why a, a, a doctor called um, Sherry Tenpenny from uh, America, who is a big uh, uh, challenger of vaccinations, she was also banned from Australia. Now, so you've got the vastness of the pharmaceutical industry that can advertise its products and vaccines on the television, but they're terrified of a handful of people going to Australia and challenging that. You know why? Because they can't win the debate. And they're so aware they can't win the debate, they're so aware it's a scam, certainly at the pharmaceutical level, that they have to shut up everybody even the smallest voice doing, uh, g giving another view. And uh, my ban from Australia has, was a big wake-up call for Australians. Um, I think the, the, the petition to get me in is you know, closing in on 20,000 now um, because it reminded them and put in their face, Australia may seem to be a free country, but it's not. Britain may seem to be a free country, it's not. Neither is America. These are illusions, um, and uh, they're terrified of other opinions. Of course, they know that what they're trying to, um, to sell the public across the range of subjects is a load of old bollocks that will not stand up to um, factual scrutiny. Where do people get your books, David? DavidIke.com. Uh, they'll get it within, tw get them within 24 hours. There's a, a, a lot of them, the... the um, the newest one is everything you need to know. Yeah, when's that told. coming out? It's out now. Um, it's been out for um, a, 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 a little while. Your and newest it, one, sorry, you were talking about. That you've yeah, not that's, that, I've just. I'm literally just finishing that. Um, Are you excited that, for that, that one? That, that will be out um, probably in about three or four months. Um, but um, I've also got a film coming out, um, which I was asked if they I could they would make a film of my life. It's called Renegade. I've seen the trailer over there? Yeah, and that is. Um, We've got some premieres of that in Manchester and London and Los Angeles and New York. And uh, the dates are on the, um, on the website, davidike.com. And I'll, I'll be attending all of them um, and uh, taking questions afterwards. And um, the, the, the movie itself will be available to, um, to, to download from uh, June the 4th. And, and it, it's about my life, yes. But my, my life is the theme, the backbone, but it's packed with information exposing the uh, the whole scam. So I'm hoping it will bring in a lot of new people to see the world 
is not actually like we thought it was. Yeah, excellent. David, for coming on my show and, and giving me your time. It's been excellent and your views, your books, you stand on stage for 10 hours at a time and give your views and your knowledge that you've got. Is there anything you'd like to finish up on and or to try and, for anybody in the struggle that's maybe trying to awaken theirself and they're maybe going through the same journey that you went 30 years ago and they're scared, what advice would you give them or what would you say to read into or maybe research that could maybe help them? Well, um, what, what transformed my life and what would transform anybody's life is to reassess their self-identity. Stop self-identifying with labels. Stop saying that's who I am. No, no, that's what you're experiencing. What you are is the awareness, the eternal state of awareness that is having the experience. And if you come from that point of view, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and outrageous abuse and Twitter storms um, are like, and? <laughs> but if you identify with the labels, it becomes massive. It becomes all-encompassing. And I would, say, I would say this more than anything else, and I'll say this to the kids, okay? The, the, the suicide of kids is just going through the frickin' roof, right, in, in, in the social media era. A lot of it, of it is uh, lack of self-respect coming from all the abuse and, and all the uh, impositions of what you should be and you're not good enough and you, you, you should be this and you're not. Remember that you are what you are and what you are now can be something else whenever you choose to uh, become the totality of what you are instead of the little me that you think you are. But if, if you look at it, the people who are abusing you who are ridiculing you, who are telling you you're not good enough, right? Well, who the hell are they? Who are, who are they? Who are they? Why do they matter? I, I can tell you from personal experience that he, people who abused me years ago are now coming to my talks and reading my books because the thing, the thing is that they'll think something else tomorrow. That's for sure. Whatever they're saying now, or they'll think something else tomorrow, and they'll say something else tomorrow. But the point is, the key point, what the hell does it matter what they think about you? What does it matter? Oh, th that person doesn't like you, gives you a hard time. Well, go, go and find someone else then. Stop interacting with them. Go, 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 go find some other people to interact with. You know, who, who are these people? Why are you allowing your life to be dictated by the opinions of other people. You are unique. No, you're not like they are, thank God, most of the time. <laughs> so why are you worried about what they think? Why are you even worried, if you get it down to, to real basics, what your parents think of you? Because you are what you are. And, you know, for me, the greatest gift you can give to your kids is to allow them to be what they are to allow them to go in the direction that they feel to go into instead of dictating to them the direction their life should take. Oh, you can't do that. Oh, you can't do that. Oh, what will the neighbors think? I mean, what will the neighbors think? Who cares? Let them think what they like. It doesn't matter. And I'll tell you from experience, it really doesn't matter what people say about you, what people do about you, what people think about you, so long as you don't care. It doesn't matter. You, it doesn't mean you don't listen to people and say, oh, yeah, they've got a point there. Maybe I'll look at that. That's not the same thing. It's, it's being intimidated and being broken in spirit by what other, how other people see you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because anyone who's ever done anything in, in the world, look out all the way through history, anyone who's made a real positive difference to the world has overwhelmingly faced ridicule and abuse before um, they were accepted to have been right all along. And the majority get accepted after they're dead. It, uh, yeah, exactly. And if they had succumbed to 
fearing and responding to how people initially felt about them, they would not have done what they did, which was eventually accepted to be correct. So when you're in a world, a programmed world with such narrow programmed perceptions of reality, if you stray beyond that, you're going to get laughed at. You're going to get ridiculed. You're going to get abused. I, I, so what? It doesn't matter. It only matters if you think it matters. You know, people abuse me. Oh, thanks for sharing that with me. Have a nice day. That's more a reflection on them, though. Of course it is. Insecure, they're lost. It's, it's like a, we, we were talking earlier, what I, what I said. You know, every time we open our mouths, we think we're making statements about other people. We're not. We're making statements about ourselves every time we open our mouths. Um, and, and people who go on social media and abuse other people behind the, um, the, uh, the cowardice of um, uh, login names... Um, is making a statement about themselves. Then they need to find themselves a mirror and maybe they uh, have a chat with it and maybe they can realize that actually the statement is about them and not the people they're abusing. Yeah, the thing is not to care. Once you care about what other people think about you, they have control of your life. Yeah. That'll be the freaking day. Yeah, perfect. David, again, mate, you've been an absolute Thanks, pleasure mate. and for what you've achieved and the balls to keep carrying on and, and doing what you do. It takes no a massive amount of courage. Check out David's Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube channel, and it'll make you question a hell of a lot of stuff. But again, mate, it's been phenomenal, and I wish you all the best for the future. The new book, um, it's been great. Thank you. Thank you, mate. Thank you. Brilliant. Cheers, Cheers man. Thank you.